Hi, I'm Benton Jew, and this is a live action and animation boys panel. Uh, I'm a member of IATSE Local 800, also known as the Art Directors Guild, and I'm part of the IMA Craft, which includes storyboard artists, concept artists, and matte painters for live action TV and film. There's also another union, which is IATSE Local 839, also known as the Animation Guild, and they cover artists, writers, technicians who make animated films, TV shows, and other content. Uh, the idea for this panel came um, from talking to some people last year at the 800 booth, and uh, they seemed confused as to where they belong in terms of storyboards. Um, there were many who really didn't seem to belong quite in 800, and they probably would have been better in 839, and I'm sure the reverse happened at the 839 booth as well. Actually, if you go to, if they're over just behind the wall over here. Um, and so, um, um, the, the, yeah, the big, um, <laughs> so anyways, so the idea of, <laughs> the idea for this, uh, so I just wanted to create a panel that clarified the differences and similarities so students could have a better idea of where they should be and let art students know the difference between the job of live action boards and the job of doing animation boards so they could better choose which field to work in. So uh, I want to introduce the panelists. To my immediate right is uh, Heiko van Drengenberg. He's an artist in the television and movie industries moving fluently between animation and live action. With two decades of experience, he's worked for all the major studios, his uh, titles include director, head of story, writer, concept designer, and storyboard artist. And to Heiko's right is Eric Ramsey. Uh, he was born in Los Angeles and started making Super 8 animation films as a teenager. He started his career as an animator and moved on to work on live action commercials and feature films. He's also worked at DreamWorks Animation and currently works in live action and animation made films. And to his right is uh, Tim Burgard. He started working in comic books, then TV animation, uh, and finally commercials, television, and feature films. He is currently an instructor of storyboarding at the Art Center College of Design. So um, let me show the slideshow first and so you can get an idea of their work. Great stuff, awesome. 
Okay, so I'll start asking questions, and what will we start with uh, Eric? And so, how did you get into animation or live action? And what did you start with first? Okay, <clears throat> I, I started in high school, really. Uh, I was 18, and a friend of mine and I were planning on doing a, an animated film. And I came up with a quick story, and uh, he was excited about it. We talked to a few people that he knew, some of the his, his friends who were uh, grown-ups, uh, some of them who worked in animation, and their advice was just, just start, just go, get going. And so uh, he came to school the next day with a peg, peg strip. I taped it onto the back of a watercolor block, and I just started animating. And every day he would call me and goes, Eric, get animating, whatever you're doing, start animating, keep animating. And I would show that film uh, to this place called Duck Soup. It was in Santa Monica. And uh, they, were, they allowed me to use their animation test system as a video animation thing. And I would come in with, what, 150 drawings at a time? And every time that I came in, they just said, I would ask for advice. They, they told me two things. Keep a sketchbook and just don't stop. And that's the only thing they ever told me the entire process. And it took me almost two years to complete. But once I did finish, I started to shop my reel around and I started getting work almost immediately. So that's how I got into anim animation. So now how did you make the transition over to live action? My older brother Peter uh, was doing storyboards for commercials and live action pictures and uh, he just kind of, he just coaxed me into it. He just yeah. convinced me I should, I should do that as well. And, uh, and uh, I just made it, it was a pretty easy transition really, because I like drawing sort of like comic book type drawings anyway. So uh, having that background as an animator, knowing motion and all those things helped me along when it came to doing live action boards. It was, it was a pretty easy transition for me. And you also had an interest in photography, right? I mean, is that, did that have any- Yeah, I was really into photography. You know, ever since I was like, you know, my mid-teens, I was always fascinated with photography, especially black and white photography for whatever reason. I love the movie uh, Woody Allen's Manhattan. It was uh, shot by Gordon Willis, and it was just uh, a huge inspiration for me. And I always loved uh, photography, especially as it pertained to films and stuff like that. I love cinematography, and uh, and, I, and again, just playing with the camera helped me in my live action storyboarding in particular. Okay, and Heiko. So how did you get how did you get started into Animation or live action? Animation doing? was, uh, I, I went to art school for illustration. I had no idea what I was, what I was gonna do. And then I took an animation class at Rhode Island School of Design. And I did my first walk cycle, and that blew me away. I, I, we had to wait a week. We shot it with a Bolex eight millimeter back then. And you sent it off to New York in the dailies, which was really a weekly came back and I saw my life cycle walking and being alive and I thought that was the greatest thing ever. So I decided I wanted to go into animation. Right. And, and how did you make the transition to live action? Live action, well, after I got into storyboarding, did storyboarding for animation for a long time, I was working on one of the Lego movies. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, there was a director there, uh, Drew Pierce, who was uh, developing a project and uh, life, uh, an animated project, but I knew he was also planning on shoot a live action movie. And since he was already familiar with my work, I said, hey, can I board your live action project? And he said, yes, and that's how I got into that. Okay, great. And was that a big adjustment or? Well, frankly, I always thought, I was already thinking uh, very, very, uh, yeah, you know, like life action, if you, if you, if you will. Uh, I was always interested in cinematography. Mm -hmm. So I think that I already used that in my animation board. So the transition wasn't that hard. The only thing that I had to adjust was the drawing style, you know, find a more naturalistic drawing style that you could use in life action. Okay. And Tim, so how, how did you get started into, did you get started in animation or live action first or how did you go? Uh, well, uh, when I got out of college, um, uh, I was still thinking along the lines of working in as a comic book artist, even though I'm out in Orange County and uh, 
literally, you know, the whole industry is on the other end of the country, you know, New York. But I did meet a few people, and uh, one person that was actually from the same city as me, Rick Hoberg, was... Um, it's a comic book artist. Yeah, the, he was, well, he was a comic book artist, but when I knew him, really, uh, he had been uh, uh, an assistant for Russ Manning for Tarzan and, uh, newspaper strips and stuff like that. But he'd also uh, did his uh, bit with uh, uh, Hanna-Barbera and, and Ruby Spears and other you know TV animation type of thing. And at the time we uh, we met, uh, he had me do cleanup over his animation storyboards. And that kind of got me in the in the door because I had already gone through, you know, the uh, all the rendering classes and stuff at Art Center. Right. So I knew how to do all kinds of other things for, you know, uh, presentation art and all that kind of deal. So I kept doing that for a while until eventually I started doing animation storyboards mm. pretty much as a freelance thing. And then to anticipate your question, uh, going into... Uh, uh, working with somebody who I'd worked with, you know, a, a freelancer who came in, a guy named Bud Lewis, basically he uh, introduced me to my agent for the first time when I went in to help him out on a commercial. So I got, uh, I got a commercial uh, agent that uh, took me on some stuff, but his goal was to get me in movies and stuff, get me in the right. union. Right. And uh, I think one of the first movies... I worked on was like the class of 1999, and that was like a future film. So, oh, right, like a so future slasher me. movie or something, right? But anybody know the, the movie Short Circuit? Yeah, the, the visual effects guy who created um, Johnny Five, that's his name, right? Johnny Five is Alive. Uh, he created these like Terminator robots. So this is like a, it's like, you know, Grease meets um, Terminator. You know, so it takes place in a high school and, and shenanigans follow. Uh, and then eventually uh, I worked on Stargate uh, after doing a few other non-union films like, um, you know, Super Mario Brothers, the first one. And, oh, come on. Well, you know what? There, I'm still getting things from fans from, from that movie. I, you, there are people, surprises me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Stargate got me in the union and I just went crazy from there. I started working on all kinds of stuff off of that, even before I was formally inducted in the, you know, in the dark room with the candles and, oh, I'm not supposed to say anything more. <laughs> the, the scars are still there. I'm sorry. Uh, so Heiko, what do you think is the biggest difference between animation storyboards and live action storyboards? Well, the sheer amount of work, I think it's a lot, it's, there's a lot more work in animation boards. Um, you, have to, you have to do a lot more posing in animation. Yeah. Um, in, in live action, you have more of a concept shot. You get the script, you sort of figure out how to shoot the movie by, uh, by composing the individual shots. But since you later on take this to a, to a uh, location or on the sound stage, whatever happens within that panel will be determined of how the actors move later, how whatever happens uh, you know, with object cars, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, stage it all out individually. Whereas in animation, when you, you have nothing in animation. When you start an animated movie, every single pixel, every single drawing, every single character, every single object, you have to design or build in some way. Hmm. Every, there, is, there are no actors, so you have to do the acting. Right. So everything has to be posed out a lot more thoroughly than, than in live action. But then in, in animation, usually you, they, they have everything set down in model sheets and turnarounds and stuff. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. If you're lucky, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think I've, I've been, I've worked on one animated movie that, that had everything already figured out. I mean, there are preliminary sketches and some things you can use, but while we're working on the boards, they're still figuring out the final design for things. So, yeah, if you're lucky, I mean, you have to, you have to come up with a lot of stuff yourself. And when you're speaking of this, are you speaking of 
uh, live, uh, animated features that you're talking about, the uh, like television series or animated features mostly. I mean, uh, on a on a on an animated series, you have mostly everything figured out. You do you do get the the turnarounds and, right, and the right. character designs. Yes. Okay. And uh, okay, Tim, same question. Uh, okay. Well, biggest, what is the, the, the difference, difference between them, or? Yeah. Um, I think with live action, what's most important is, uh, or what they, they're hiring you to do, is lay down a documentation of the, how the movement is going on, and that is the movement of the camera and the movement in front of the camera and how they interact together. And essentially, uh, everything else is, you know, except for certain things, elements like mood, there are occasionally things like lighting and storytelling, but as far as rendering and stuff like that, I mean, you, anybody's style is valid, you know, unlike animation, which, especially in boarding, where you have to be on model most of the time. Not so much these days. I have seen more modern type of things back in the days when I was working on Simpsons and stuff like that in the first two seasons or uh, earlier on, you know, like, uh, 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 there actually was a Rambo animated show, by the way. I don't know if you know that. It, ca it came on bef just after Romper Room out here locally with, at, at 6.30 in the morning or something. Anyway, uh, and, uh, in animation, everything, everything in the film, anything in, your in the animation is boarded. Okay? And so you have uh, composition, you have acting, uh, the hardest thing that is different between the two is camera work because everything that is involved in camera work and animation, uh, with the exception of nowadays where they have virtual camera uh, uh, CGI animation, um, that you can do anything and even more than what a live action camera can do. But in the old style 2D animation, you have to design those shots to approximate what a, a camera can do. Okay, and sometimes it involves trick shots and things like that. So it, it has a lot to do with the camera work, mm -hmm. the difference between the two. Okay. All right, and then uh, Eric, same question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> whereas in, <clears throat> excuse me, live action, live action boarding is more about cinematic grammar, uh, and like Tim and Heiko were saying, about how the camera moves and uh, very fundamental uh, uh, things like that. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a complicated set of instructions on how to shoot the movie, because every drawing should represent what the camera is actually going to capture. Uh, and, in, and like in 3D animation, it's a bit more of that as well, but like in 2D animation, it wasn't quite that way. Um, but the, one of the bigger differences, I, I would say, is that in animation storyboarding, there's a bigger emphasis on uh, performance, the character's performance, and character development and story development. So you can be handed a sequence, and whereas in live action, you wouldn't have to worry about exactly how it's supposed to be, how it's supposed to end or begin or any kind of an arc that way. But in animation, when you're given a sequence, you almost want to make it almost a self-contained film. It's got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's a lot... Uh, like I said, performative, as, as opposed to just pure cinematic. Isn't there also, I suppose, in, in the animation world, they tend to ask you to sort of write yes. uh, more, more the gags, come up with the gags more? Where, yes, when absolutely. When I was live action, you're doing more, you're going from the script. Yeah, mm, well, <laughs> sometimes. Because <laughs> a lot of times they, they ask you to just, you know, there's a, there's a line in the script, there's a big action sequence or a big chase scene, just come up with something. And then, you know, you do your thing and you go over it with the director and all the, the department heads and, and then eventually the writer sort of changes the script to that. But yeah, like in animation, um, part of the expectation is to, uh, is to add your own personality, your own uh, take on it. And a lot of times in both animation and live action, especially in animation, you tend to be typecast or, or uh, you, you, you get hired on based on your strengths. So if you're good at action, you're going to do this sequence. If you're really good at character interactions, uh, they, they'll put you on a different sequence. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Any of you guys 
have anything I, to add? I have one thing to add to this, and that is that hopefully none of you will have to deal with this the way I did in, uh, for, uh, at Deke for uh, Captain Nintendo, and that is, and luckily I, I went on to The Simpsons, which is totally like it was the, the antidote to this. They would take their scripts and they would submit them to standard and practices or the network or whatever. They would bleach out anything that was humorous in it to the point where it was like hello and goodbye or like had the most meaningful dialogue in the whole thing. And then they expected us to put the humor back in visually. <laughs> And uh, you never seen such something so hideous as South Korean uh, Saturday morning artists trying to um, do the uh, Tex Avery, you know, Chuck Jones gags I was doing. It, it came out horrendous, where popping eyeballs became these crustacean eyes on on frozen sticks that were going. It was like so. Um, I you know, believe me, uh, they made me work for my money on there because I. Everything that was taken out of the script, I had to put in visually. Okay. Yeah, there's many occasions when you work on an animated feature and they literally say, hey, this page doesn't work, these pages don't, don't work, come up with something else. So you are, you are literally writing that, uh, that, that passage. So you're replacing the, uh, the script pages with something that you come up with. And the more you plus it, the better. I mean, there's... A lot of times uh, you're being asked to write gags, even dialogue, whole passages, action sequences. Mm. That's all part of that game yeah, in the animation. I know Pixar, they usually have some, a, a pretty big kind of presentation when, when they do a pitch. Well, the thing about it is that what you don't have in live action is that you have the so-called story room. So you got the story team together in a, on an animated feature mm -hmm. where you have a whole bunch of people basically uh, figuring it out together. And you can actually, if you're stuck in the sequence, you can go over to your buddy and say, hey, which, which gag do you like better? Do you think this works? Which is actually kind of cool to have that interaction. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of times uh, a stronger point on writing the story uh, rather than exactly figuring out what the, uh, what the framing's going to be later. Because at some point, once you're done with the storyboards and they're all in the animatic, you're going to take that to the layout department and they're going to figure out the exact, uh, you know, lenses and, 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 and camera. Mm -hmm. Well, it does seem, it does seem interesting that, uh, you know, there's, there is, in animation, there is a little bit more of that interaction that goes between, you know, your, your peers that, that you're there. And oftentimes when you're working in animation, you're working in a studio and I think uh, live action, you tend to be more like lone wolves, I guess. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, um, everybody, has anybody here done uh, TV style animation before? Raise your hands. Um, remember, uh, for a half hour show, or rather 22 minute show, they would break down a script into acts. It would be like three different acts. And that's something where you would have to find out from the person, say you were doing, especially if it's a middle act you'd have to find out where the person that ends his board from the act one, and then let the person doing act three know how you're gonna be transitioning. And by the way, you're all working at the same time. So it's not like that, that act one is done at the moment you're doing act two. Uh, so you really have to be on board on that type of thing. When you're de dealing with uh, live action, it's episodic, or it's rather in different chunks, and it depends who you're working with. You could be working with the second unit uh, visual effects or, or stunts or somebody like that, and then they have a specific thing where something blows up and a car flies off a cliff and all that kind of stuff, and that's all you're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, yeah, you could just do your scene, you know? Uh, the only part where it really matters is if you're doing something similar to something else that's happening. And maybe the things that you're thinking of that can help uh, improve this may be the same thing that the other guy is doing, right? You know, we had a section in uh, Jurassic World that they had two pteranodon uh, attacking helicopter gags, and one of them had to go. And that one was mine, but, uh, but, but they, they cannibalized almost everything but the helicopter 
to work in different scenes that they did do. So um, you do end up, uh, there is a big difference in that case on how you work together. Right. Right. I mean, there is also, you know, uh, live action. We do have sort of that other uh, thing about being on set or being on location and being, you know, going on uh, tech scouts or whatever it is to, to see what the space is like and being inside, you know, the helicopter or whatever it might be so that you understand the space. Um, I don't know if you guys have any. There is a little bit difference with that, though. Um, in a live action, you have to understand your environment because in your head, you're moving 360 degrees plus up plus down uh, in that environment, you know? Um, maybe a little different if you're on set, which things are built just for the places where the camera is gonna look. In storyboarding for animation, you could have a script and none of that is actually done. Mm -hmm. And they actually have to follow you you know, saying, okay, I'm going to do this, you know, uh, uh, Errol Flynn swinging in on a rope through, you know, a shark pond or something like that. Well, you know what? If they don't do that shark pond exactly the same way I did my storyboard, then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. You got to, you, well, in life action, you got to, you got to understand what your limitations are and you got to work within those limitations. And what I mean by that is if, if you are going on a, on a, on a scout and, and you have location photos of a house, uh, you, can, you, can you can put the camera anywhere you want. You gotta, you gotta board it in a way that, it's, that they're able to shoot it correctly. And you don't wanna put more work on them because then you're gonna have to do, redo your boards. If they say, hey, we can't, you know, I've, I've had a case where, where I put a drone shot in and they said we can't afford a drone, so you gotta have to redo it. And so, I used, I used the camera rig that they had, which was a camera on a, on a tech arm on a car, and I replicated that shot using that that tech in mind. So it's it's, it helps you as a board artist if you know where you're going, and it helps them because it makes it makes the whole process more streamlined. Okay. All right. So. Uh, say if I was a young artist and you were looking at my portfolio, what would be the thing that would tell you if I should be doing animation boards or live action boards? What, what would you look for to advise me one way or the other? Uh, how about uh, right. Tim first? Okay, um, if you're versatile in your, in your style, meaning you could do comedy or you can do uh, action type of thing, that would be a good trait for being a storyboard artist for uh, animation, and you would have that other end to work in live action. If you only show like, you know, manga style, big eyeball people, and, uh, and you know, there's basic structure too. Every, almost every animated character is what, like five foot, five heads high, something like that. Sometimes it's even more, some of it's almost two heads high. You know, if that's the way you draw everything, then I guess you're doomed to be an animator. But, um, but if, you, if you have a, a control over things like that, um, I said earlier, the beautiful thing about uh, working in live action other than in animation is that you just work, you just draw. You know, if it's representational, if it looks like what it's supposed to be, if it's a car, or, you know, like a sedan or it's an ice cream truck, and if there's a, you know, a kid or an adult, you don't have to be stylized or anything, you know, the way that you would do it in an in a animated show. It doesn't have to look like Seth MacFarlane's style or, or, or Matt Groening's style. Um, but on the other hand, if you're gonna have a career in animation, you better be able to draw Matt Groening's style or, or Chuck Jones or whatever, you know? Okay, Eric, same question. Um, I think that if you could, like these days, because you know of the prevalence of 3D animation. Because the thing is, there's a difference between doing 2D animation boards and 3D animation boards. 3D animation boards are a lot closer to live action. So if you can do live action boards, you can probably do pretty well in animation. But again, it's it's about performance. If you if you have a sense of humor, if you know how to bring a character to life then animation's for you, and whether that's 2D or 3D. Um, 
And I think is I've learned a ton working in 3D that I brought over to my live action boards. A ton about how to tell stories, about how to bring character out. Uh, that you don't get so much in live action, but in animation you do. So if that's your, if you have a, you know, predilection, or if you have a a, a talent for that, then you're invaluable in animation. Yeah, I use my animation skills every day in live action. Everything I've every learned day. every day. Yeah. Every day. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, yes, all these skills I've learned they translate well, and they're being appreciated too. I, I found that even more recently that that directors l uh, appreciate if I if I uh, you know draw more panels and actually flush it out a little bit more. I don't know if that has to do with uh, CGI production or not. I don't know, but that seems to be the trend recently. Um, other than that, I think, uh, yeah, if you, uh, a animation takes, takes a bit of bringing yourself into it. You definitely, you, there's definitely a, a performance point because you, you sort of have to think like the characters, you have to become the actor. So if you're good at that, then that's definitely a route you can take. Uh, you should be prepared to always plus up what's on the page. Mm -hmm. So if you're good at, uh, being funny, making people laugh, that's always a good thing for animation. Um, if for, for life action, drawing representationally is, 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 uh, is definitely important. Okay. All right, so um, all three of you are dual card members of both 839 and 800, which is you know, fairly unusual, but um, if, if you weren't sure what you wanted to do, you know, as a as a young student, um, uh, what would what would it it be that would help you make that decision to go one way or the other? In eight thirty nine. Make a choice. Yeah, yeah, if you had to make a choice, what what would you look inside yourself as as to choose between eight thirty nine in the animation guild or eight hundred in the um, you know. Animation is a little bit uh, on, on the difficult side. You get to do some more, you know, fantastical stuff occasionally. But um, I have a little warning for people, if you don't know this already, you know, the, the way that they, at least for uh, TV animation, the, the job is not just storyboarding anymore. It's timing, it's creating an animatic, it's doing all this other stuff that I never had to do. I just had to worry about the, the, the storytelling and uh, my composition and my drawing. I didn't have to worry about, you know, turning in something that, you know, it's like an animatic that the lips sync to the, the you know, the soundtrack or the, 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 the uh, voice track and all that kind of stuff. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I have to stay with live action, you know, and occasionally I get to do dinosaurs, you know, not, you know so. <laughs> The Animation Guild has a 401k. <laughs> <laughs> the ADG doesn't. Um, uh, well, well, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really hard for me to say that, like looking at myself, how I got into it. It's just sort of like, because I took it one step at a time. I was fascinated by one thing at the time, so I didn't even think of choosing. You know, it's, it's really just what you're what you're most passionate about, I guess. Uh, it's, it's, for me, it was getting into animation and then sort of discovered life action afterwards. But yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. It depends on what your passion is, really. I mean, uh, I fell in love with animation when I was a kid. I just loved Bugs Bunny cartoons. I love my favorite movie, still to this day, I think is the original King Kong, 1933. And that was a massive influence on my life. Uh, it taught me animation, again, learning s photography uh, and how to meld the two together. It's a very sophisticated movie. Um, and I, I developed a passion for animation and I think at the same time for live action as well from watching uh, King Kong. But it's, uh, it depends on what your passion is really. You know, uh, some people are drawn to it because they have outgoing personalities and really like to be performative. And I'd say that You'd go, you should go into animation for that. Uh, and, and in live action, these days, uh, more and more uh, people are building animatics out of the live action boards. Uh, 
Uh, and so you kind of have to have a mind for that while you're drawing live action boards as well. So they're kind of similar in that way. But it all depends on what you feel strongest for personally. They're both terrific. I love my job. <laughs> um, by the way, if I do live action stuff, I'm not really giving up animation because anything, uh, you know, any Marvel film, you know, all the um, Jurassic World, all of that type of stuff, anything that's VA, uh, visual effects, that's animation. Yeah. That's all, that's, you're doing it for the computer, you're trying to make it match live action camera work and all of that kind of stuff, but it's all animation. In fact, uh, you know, that, uh, when I work on those sequences, I take that into account. It is a uh, performance. It is all of the, all the type of things that you have to do in an animated show. You know, it's it's when you're doing live action when Arnold Schwarzenegger walks in a room, it's just, he's just going to do what he's going to do. You know, he, no actor has ever looked at my board saying, "Oh yes, that's how I should approach the part." You know, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but yeah, I could you know, I could I could work I could work under seven uh, or eight hundred and still do animation. I, I, I do it all the time. Okay. So uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. If you would just come up to this microphone right here. Just make sure you speak into the microphone if you have any questions. Go ahead. Hey there. Hi, my name's Amy. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, like we have, you know, a, a lot of studios in the other room with their booths. So I think a lot of people here are very clear on the system of how you apply and how you how you get into animation. Um, but it, the live action world is a little bit more mysterious. Do you have agents? How do you, you know, how does that how does that work? Well, unfortunately, there are no recruiters in live action. So as you know, there's a lot of recruiters in, in animation studios. They actively go out and look for new talent. You don't get to do that in live action. Uh, it's in live action. It's really who you know, like the old the old saying. It's who you know. And, uh, and my my best advice is always build your network, build your network locally, join groups that are like minded, join uh, uh, like industry events where you might meet people. But uh, you know, start out. If you if you want to do storyboards in live action, maybe you start out to uh, boards to board for a local band, uh, to a music video. You can do uh, you can do uh, li um, student films um, to build your portfolio up. But at the end, at at the end of it all, it comes down to that one person that you know that can get you the job. So your network is really your best ally to do, to get there. Well, uh, I think I mentioned that I kind of got into live action through, I had already been working in animation, and I got in through working in commercials. Uh, I mean, at least the live action portion of it, right? So um, I got used to working with the director that way, you know? Because um, when you're boarding on animation, quite often you are the director. So I learned to be more collaborative, you know, as far as, uh, you know, I got fired from my first uh, commercial job, by the way, because I thought the director was just going to tell me everything. And, and I guess that works some places, but in this particular case, they said, well, you're not giving me any ideas. And I was, oh, I had ideas. I just didn't want to bug you with them, you know. So uh, having, an, having an agent for commercial work is one way of getting your foot in the door. And occasionally these, uh, you know, uh, agencies get requests for board artists on film or TV or something like that. Um, you might want to come over to the uh, uh, ADG booth and, you know, hear the, hear how that happens, you know. Um, but yeah, I was in 839 before I was in, at, at the time, 790, and then we got sucked into 800. Don't make me tell you that whole story. But um, yeah, that's uh, live action can go through Commercials, which are, you know, minute for minute, the most expensive film still to make, so. Yeah, the way I got into live action was um, through an agent. Uh, my brother was at an agency, and I uh, just, uh, in my spare time, I just did spec storyboards for commercials or a scene from a film or whatever, and I uh, presented it to the agency, and I got hired on by the agency, and that's how I started working. Mostly 
uh, television commercials and music videos, and then eventually starting to do films. But uh, that's the way I got in. That's the way I started. It was through an agent. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, please. Hi, I'm Esther. I actually, thank you for, uh, well, one, thank you for um, coming here and giving a talk and shedding light on this whole uh, <laughs> adventure, I would say, for trying to even um, do live action. I actually, my question is really similar to the previous one because I actually came from concept art. So, like, I, I know, like, back in the day, it was, like, a director found your artwork and was, like, now you're on the film. So I'm guessing that hasn't changed much from them, but from the storyboard perspective, do you have any advice for the type of like panels like to show? You know, like if this is, hey, if, we're, if you only want to do action, right? You only do action, but like showing like 50 panels or 100 panels or like, are they expecting more from you? Like, do you have any advice on the more technical presentation of it? Um. If you have samples, uh, yes, you want to have a sequence that you know comes to the, comes to a point. Fifty panels? Oh my God, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Have them in your back pocket, but don't try and show them fifty. You know, uh, the art of portfolio is is a thing that we could do a whole thing on right now. Um, but one of the main things is keep them interested. You know, show them your best work, you know, uh, and, and literally be sure this is something that, uh, if you've been paid for it, and saying this is a job I did for Coca-Cola or something like that, you know, those are the things that you want in your portfolio, okay? And uh, also, I guess, if we're talking about live action stuff, show them that you know camera, okay? Don't have like, God help me, 50 panels and all close-ups, you know, move the camera around, show them that you understand filmmaking. That's how you, you know, those are the samples you want to show. Yes, uh, what, what Tim said, and be clear, you know, be, be able to demonstrate that you can build a sequence uh, with, you know, I don't know, 20 less panels and demonstrate that you can that you can convey information, that you can be efficient in your information. You don't want to, you don't want to, uh, if you can lose a panel and it doesn't hurt the story, take it out. Yeah. And, and, and be clear that you can, uh, that you understand film language in terms of your, ca uh, your camera language uh, and your, uh, and um, yeah, your, your, your presentation of your boards. I do, I, one more thing too. And that is when you're showing somebody your work, keep in mind that they want you to get as much information out on, a, on your storyboards uh, as you can in, the amount of, in a short amount of time. So if you bring in like these beautifully rendered boards that belong, you know, as uh, maybe in a comic book or something like that, they're gonna kind of look at you and say, oh, this must have taken five hours for this person to do or something like that. If you have a style that gets all the information but clearly is loose and you know can uh, you know show everything without without being too precious on on your rendering, that's one of the things that will work. If you can always have a couple of panels saying, but if you want to gussy up, I have that, you know. Yeah, always have more in your back pocket. Show them the good stuff. Be brief about it, and then if they're interested. You know, have a URL handy where you can give it to them so they can look at more stuff. Yeah, basically, efficiency and clarity is the name of the game, basically. Sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next person, please. Hi. My name is Monique. Um, I want to say thank you guys for coming out here for Lightbox. I'm actually a big fan of Eric and his brother. Um, I had a quick question. As somebody who has like a film background, has an animation degree, doesn't have like skills and as an artist, quote unquote, like, I can't make no like this. Mm -mm. I can't do it. Practice. But, but, mm, I know. Trust me, tra practice. Anybody in this room can do this. It just takes mileage. It just takes uh, just wanting to do it. Yeah. I just wondered how, what was the steps to get to the art director um, route? Do you have to start 
from storyboarding to um, writing or like what's the steps? Because I was just thinking that. You're talking about art direction and animation, correct? Uh, like an art director, like somebody who can take somebody's idea and say, okay, this is the direction we're gonna go. Art, art direction is like a different skill altogether. I would put art direction is a little bit like being an, an architect or something like that. You have yeah. to understand you know, the environment that you're building. You know, uh, storyboard artists basically take what they put together and, and we play in that play yard. They, they, we're, we're like the kids in the playground. Uh, the playground has to be built, you know? Um, so those are, that's the basic stuff of the art director. I have, you know, uh, uh, we have had people, you know, go from being storyboard artists to, uh, you know, film directors and stuff like that. Ed Vero, a storyboard artist who worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark, became a production designer. Mm -hmm. And a production designer is who? He's basically the head art director, right? Chris Glass, right? Chris Glass? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are others. Uh, Chris Glass is another guy who was a storyboard artist. He's now a production designer. Uh, my brother Peter was a storyboard artist, and now he's a, he's a director. So, uh, and everybody has a different story about how they make that transition. So uh, it's, it's kind of a tough question to answer. Actually. It's okay. Do the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. To, I'm sorry. Oh, ma'am. Sorry, sir, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I wasn't prepared for that question. Either. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just, you know, I didn't want to put no pressure on y'all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Phil, do you want to answer that? I'm not, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Oh, um, my question is, should I start all over again? I'm sorry, I'm being unintentionally funny. Okay, so my question is, how, what is the steps to be an art director? Like, you know, in every episode or a film, there's right, a director. Right, 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 right. Yes. Well... I'm not quite sure because oh. that you know is not what we do. Oh. Um, but I, I, I would uh, I would suggest to go over to the uh, ADG booth and ask them about it because they they would they would know that for sure. Oh. The Art Directors Guild booth. Um, I'm not sure where they are. Are they? Yeah, it's, it's at the, um, 929 on the 900 block of of the convention. It's in the it's in the yeah, rear corner of and the I main exhibition hall. And I think there might be some, hall. I don't know if they have some programs, some intern programs or something. I have no idea, but they would be the ones to ask to, uh, to get your question answered. Okay, so practice storyboarding. Always, always practice. If you want to be a storyboard artist, practice, practice, practice. And if you want to be director, go to the booth. Okay, no, I think you guys answered my question. No, no, no. <laughs> I think you guys, y'all did good. All right, let me go. Okay, if you want to be a director, you got to make films. Oh, I'm, I make films. It's, well, it's then you already are a director. Oh, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next, please. Uh, hold up. Uh, hello? Uh, howdy. Uh, Avery. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting this panel and uh, question. Uh, it might vary from like different like production to production, but like, is there a sort of like general number of like, hey, we need this sequence in like X amount of days. Like, is there like a number such as that? Like depending on like live action versus animation? Uh, there are always deadlines, uh, but sometimes, you know, you work on a sequence, you could be working on a sequence for months in live action. Usually in animation, you want to, it, it's a little bit quicker, but the whole show run is, could be like, what, years sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely there's deadlines that you have to, to meet, so you have to keep that in mind too, in, in, in terms of uh, how detailed you want your drawings uh, and what you want to put in uh, and all those, those kinds of things, so yeah. If you have a scene with two people at a table in a room, you can, you can board three pages very easily, but if, if you have just one sentence says, and then, and then there was a big battle between two armies, that's gonna take you a while. <laughs> you know, it really depends on what, what that assignment is that you have at the time, and how are they pressed for time. You know, sometimes you just don't have the, sometimes you have to do a complicated thing in a short amount of time, and that's when you adjust your drawings and do the best you can to get that out and meet the deadline. I basically would say this is, uh, depends on if you're working on uh, more of an assembly line situation, 
like in TV animation, um, you had three weeks to do an act. That's what you had. I did it faster so that I can uh, get another job, you know, before that three weeks, because I, therefore, I'm making more per week than I would have before. Um, but, uh, you know, and TV, they uh, hire you to do all of this stuff by the next day or two days because that's the time you have because they're going to shoot the show in two days from where you're hired. So, you know, sometimes you absolutely know how much time you have because that's what they're giving you. If you're on a show where the director will you know, look at today's boards and say, um, okay, I changed my mind. Everything happens on Pluto now, you know? And, uh, you know, and there's all kinds of uh, examples of that in, in uh, film and not so much in TV, but uh, definitely in film, where they'll, they'll scrap whole sequences or change them around and may even go on hiatus for a while. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the closer you are to a, um, typical uh, Model T Ford factory, uh, you know, uh, assembly line, uh, the more you're going to know just how much time you have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a great day. Uh, sorry, did, did I interrupt? Uh, okay, cool. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, please. Uh, hi, how's it going? Um, I'm Griffin. Uh, thank you for hosting this panel. Um, my question is, um, when it comes to um, like storyboarding, I've heard it said that um, a way to you know get better is, of course, to watch more films and like expand like uh, you know your your genres and what you watch. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious, what directors or films do you guys personally swear by that make you better storyboard artists, whether for live action or animation? Akira Kurosawa. Watch his movies for the camera movement. And you will see if you then watch Spielberg movies. He got his, he got his camera moves from Kurosawa. So it's, it's like, you know, it's no, nobody just shows up and does it in, in a vacuum. Um, especially watch Jurassic Park for the camera moves. There's, there's always a beginning, a middle, and an end to those moves. And in each of these moves, reveal something that you don't see coming. And then you get more information. So you get to the end where you get the solution of that, of that move and the most information. And uh, so I'd suggest for that, for the camera was definitely watch Spielberg and Kurosawa. Um, I would start with Hitchcock because Hitchcock literally made the movie before cameras even started shooting. That was the most boring part for him. You know, you know, it's like, okay, now I got to deal with actors, you know, that kind of deal. Um, so, uh, uh, but of course, when you're taking older movies, you're thinking static shots, which is not the, the current style. I mean, you know, for a while after the, Her uh, the Revenant and Birdman, everybody wanted to do extended uh, shots where you're following people down the street for 15 minutes. But um, uh, there's... There's styles as well, okay? Now, the thing that, you know, honestly, uh, just from a, a completely commercial standpoint, um, my dinner with Andre probably didn't have that many storyboards. <laughs> okay? If you get my drift, yeah. you know? So, essentially, you're going to look for movies where they needed to storyboard it, you know? And... Uh, and, and keep in mind, I mean, you can always, you know, the original King Kong. I mean, there's always, you know, older movies that are very, that will teach you, that will hold up. Some things definitely are of their era, you know. Okay? I would say, um, I would add basically everything. You should look at everything. I mean, every, every era, every country has, has its uh, own little masterpieces and... Uh, you should be seeing a lot of different, uh, a lot of different genres. Don't let it, whether it's film noir or a, you know a, a, a Chambara film or or whatnot. I mean, uh, they all have some of that. I would also just to to watch a movie without the sound. It makes you more aware of the cuts. Yeah, silent movies like say Battleship of Temkin with 
Yeah, Absolutely. Solid. I mean, the silent ones, but even the ones with sound that you just, where you just turn off the sound. It can be a modern film and just watch it without the sound and just let the pictures speak, with, speak to you. And it is, there's nothing wrong with looking at a sequence and, and seeing what you could improve about it. You know, if you, uh, it, it, it trains your eyes when you watch a movie and say, I wouldn't have cut to that shot. I would have, I would have chosen another shot. That right. sort of like, you know, empowers you to, to build your own voice. Yeah, I would just say, any, whatever movie that turns you on personally, uh, whatever your favorite movies are, just study them. Just study them. You know, like Haiko said, Kurosawa is a master at moving the camera and using his actors. Uh, uh, Scorsese, I would say, look at his films. Because his style just changed the way a lot of people started using the camera. It's just the way it is. And there are just really old movies and obscure movies. That, there's a movie called I Am Cuba, and it was made in the 50s, I believe. And it's amazing what they can do with a camera. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing. So I'd say anything, even down to like the French New Wave pictures. There's something lyrical and beautiful about how they shoot their movies that just, it's, it's a, yeah, it's inspiring. And I would just say anything that you love, study what you love. Okay, we're down to the last five minutes. So Thank I you. see we've added a few people. So if you can make your questions quick, we'll try and get to them and if you guys make your answers fairly quick. Okay, hi, um, my question applies to both animation and live action storyboard. So recently I watched, uh, I read the article on Cartoon Brew and there are like AI software that you can put the script and add the camera angle and movement that you want and then it can help you draw the storyboard. So I, the question is, in your opinion, is there any specific skills or um, how can we adapt to the incoming technology or what kind of skill as a story, like visual storytellers, that whether how AI gonna come help us, like how do we survive that, like as a story artist? I think primarily <clears throat> as a storyteller, uh, you know, we're trying to interpret our emotions through the art that we're doing. And a computer doesn't have any emotions. It just doesn't. It's a copycat. It's not a, it's, that doesn't have its own feelings or anything like that. And I think that's the biggest thing that you can take away from that. And, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's mainly it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, uh, that new technology falls short for your human intuition. I mean, the human brain cross-references with so many things, your own experiences, your own emotions, and you build something, you don't even know how you build it. But that is, uh, that is the thing that sets you apart from, from a machine, and that is still what is appreciated as a storyteller, to bring that, you know, that, that little extra into, into the story. Okay, thanks. Next, please. Yeah. How you doing? You guys are awesome. Um, I have, like, the l young lady who like, was the first one said, we all understand how to get into animation storyboarding, and I just want to kind of go back there. I'm sorry, this is a very novice question, but I don't, and if you guys can briefly kind of help, like, someone who hasn't gone to um, school and has the degrees and had the opportunity in school to make the connections to kind of break into animation storyboarding, what kind of advice would you give someone who's trying to do that? I would just say, you just have to build up a portfolio. You'd have to work on your own stuff. Um, if you have a story that you have that you want to tell, tell that story the best way you can. Um, uh, that's, that's basically it. I mean, I don't know what else to, to do to say about... Uh, yeah. You know, even when I was working, even when I was first breaking into animation, I would go home at the end of the long day I'd have me a cup of, uh, you know, some cereal or a cup of tea or whatever, and I'd open up my sketchbook and I would practice for the next four hours or whatever. I mean, I'd practice and drew every single day. Yeah. Well, the, you have to demonstrate that you can do it. How you get there is really up to you. You know, like, like Eric said, practice, work on your own. You don't have to go to school to get those skills. There's plenty of YouTube, uh, you know, classes you can take, and, but you just have to work on it and demonstrate to the people you're showing your portfolio to that you can do the job just as well as the people who already work there. Like anybody else, you have to walk in and prove to them or get their confidence that you can do the job. Now, um, on the uh, 
possibility of working on a shop that is already a union, 839. Uh, the cool thing is the same way that I did. I just, they hired me, you know, and then two weeks later they said, okay, you want to still work here? Uh, you got to join the union. And that's a lot easier than uh, going through live action, believe me. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you. Next, please. We're yeah, animation high as anybody. We're down to the last two. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming here. I just have two very quick questions. Um, so who does the storyboarder go through in live action? Who is kind of their department head? Who do they talk to um, for the most part? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. You Nobody. To, usually, usually it's the director. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes when you're working on a picture, you're, you're working with the, uh, the second unit and with the stunt guys, which is a blast. I love working with those guys. So you but, wouldn't go through the production designer? No. Okay. Okay. Now, technic no, technically you're part of that department? And they're, they're the ones that basically cut your paycheck. But no, you don't actually have, have a supervisor in that job. You're like your director is, is, the, is the one person you are, you are reporting to. Okay. Yeah, sometimes you're hired by the production designer, but we're not designers. We work with the director. That's, that's our thing. Okay, thank you. I've okay. worked with editors. I, I, I think we're... I literally, think we're literally, they wanted to plug in a few shots that they didn't get, and they have to go back and shoot it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, I think we've run out of time, but if you still have a, I think we have I can one more skip question. My question so if she you just you could just come and grab us out in the hallway if you have a question. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you.